it seems as though in the year 2022 and even probably beginning in the mid 2010 time frame give or take around the time that amazon started taking off it seems like that this notion of every business is more exciting to talk about except retail businesses really started to take off it seems like there is never uh, news or podcasts or anything done on an actual retail store or a retail chain or anyone being excited about retail well except for one guy there is a guy by the name of bob fibs and he is a retail pioneer he is someone who is just as excited about retail in 2022 as ever before and he's our guest today Bob thinks, though, that retail has to change. Retail can't be the same as it always was, where people don't have options. You can't just appeal to a, a warehouse type of layout where you just compete on price or, or anything like that. Bob believes that you need to have an experience. And, and how can you provide this experience for your customers? He is a renowned speaker, public speaker. He has been on every TV channel you can think of. He has been the retail champion for years and years. And he is somebody that I have watched training videos and looked up to for several years now. I hope that you will get as much out of this episode as I did and in rejuvenate yourself into retail and, and re and encourage yourself to double down on this retail experience that you can provide for your customers. Now on to the episode. Hello and welcome to the Better Business Podcast, the podcast that helps you improve your family-owned retail business. My name is Steve Cook. I'm a third generation business owner. And with the things I've learned and talk about on the show, I've taken my family's retail business to over $10 million in sales. Now let's get to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a very special guest today. Bob Fibbs stepped into the fight to give brick and mortar retailers a fighting chance in 1994. Bob is an internationally recognized business strategist, customer service expert, sales coach, marketing mentor, author of three books, and a motivational business speaker. He's got a lot of free time. But what makes Bob the world's leading expert on brick-and-mortar retailers is his client list. His clients include Caesars Palace, Hunter Douglas, Lego, Omega, Hearts on Fire, Husqvarna, Vieira Bradley, and Yamaha, and those are just a handful. Bob was named one of the top retail influencers of 2018, and he is an American Express Merchant Advisor, IBM Retail Futurist, Retail Wire Brain Trust Partner, and his website and blog have been named Best on the Planet for Retail in both 2017 and 2018 by FeedBuzz. Bob... That's exhausting, but I want to give you I wanted to give you the recognition you deserved. I followed you for many, many years as a retailer and uh wanted to thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Stalker. I appreciate that. <laughs> it goes right along with Steve. It's so go. perfect. No, I and I wanted to talk to you. Anybody that's doing ten million in uh animal feed, dude, and uh entrepreneur background, uh there's not many like you out there in the world. So I think this is gonna be fun. So um but, you know, we should all be in the metaverse right now anyway, because that's where we should that's all right. be spending our time trying to live that's in a right. game environment, because that's the future. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, I'm disappointed you didn't bring your uh, virtual headset, but I guess I guess the microphone will have to do old school, my friend. So so talk to me, man. Um, what is the future of retail? What's the state of retail in 2022? I think we kind of had a uh, um, coming on the back of um maybe having a lot of click and collect things and e-commerce accelerated over the last few years. What's, what's the state of retail in your opinion in 2022? Well, with a pandemic that's still going on and a possible third world war, it's all, it's all sunshine, my friend, it's all good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I do think that if you made it through the pandemic shutdowns and whether you were essential or non-essential, you've pretty much been through the fire and figured it out. I think, um, you know, it's such a big question you asked, and I would just say I think we're we are seeing 
that employees want to be valued more than ever before. I think that in the future, we're going to find that the retail salesperson is going to be a skilled uh, workforce. It's going to deserve a higher pay. It's not going to be the disposable anyone who doesn't have training uh, can get a job because already, you know, you can do OnlyFans and strip for people. You can be an Uber driver. You could do DoorDash. But the, you know, when I grew up, long before you were born, my friend, the only shot when you were getting going to be an entrepreneur was maybe you'd go mow lawns or have a paper route or something like that. And then you'd start in retail because either that or you're going to be digging ditches. You're going to be doing something manual. And, and we figured it out. That's kind of, you know, mm. I, I always used to think, what the hell am I doing in retail? Because I got my degree as a conductor. You can park that there yeah. later. But um, and then suddenly you realize, <laughs> wow, all of this knowledge of how I've learned how psychology works when influencing people, and having fun in a brick or mortar store. Hey, this is going to be my thing. Great. And then a lot of people move on into marketing or sales or their own business or they rise to C-level execs, but they all learn those lessons in retail when they were figuring it out. So for younger people, they grew up on the Food Network, Steve. So they learned everything was it's three quarters of a tablespoon at you know two minutes and th everything was precise to get an Instagrammable picture. So they come into your mm -hmm. store and you're like, uh, go move that from there over there and fulfill this. And it's like, can I just have a lobotomy, please? And we don't <laughs> treat them or train them when they're the most hopeful, educated group ever. And so the smart retailers are going like, holy crap, uh, what does this mean? And my final point is retail is a game of being brilliant on the basics. As you know, it's, yeah, you could do mm -hmm. metaverse. I get it. You could... Uh, by influencers. There's a million ways people will spend your money, right? But if it really yeah. comes down to it, it's really very small. How did somebody feel when they came in contact with you and your brand in your store? If you mm. master that, life's great. If you miss that, you're pretty much a warehouse for other people's products. And you know what? There's always somebody cheaper. So talk to me about, you said that retail is about sticking to the basics and, or, you know, doing the basics well, I guess. And I completely agree with that. Do you think that retailers need to act differently going forward? And what I mean by that is high end retailers, um, meaning the, the ticket items that they're selling, if they're selling a very high ticket item versus a low ticket item, or maybe they're selling small products that could be shipped, or they're selling large products like we do that are heavy and can't really be shipped via UPS. Do all retailers need to act differently in your opinion, or do you think that they are all kind of need to check the same basic boxes? Well, you know, I've worked with some of the highest luxury brands in the world with half a million dollar necklaces all the way down. I was the CMO of a coffee franchise where it was $4 was the average sale. Hmm. And people love to say, oh, we couldn't, or that's not us. Well, that's fine. Hmm. That's not us as Walmart so or Amazon, <laughs> right? They have amazing amounts of data, and it's just a numbers game. We know that if we put this on an end cap, it's that. But most stores don't have that traffic. And I think you're a feed store. Isn't that what you, you guys do? So Correct. we had a yep. Karina dealer uh, join SalesRx, my online retail sales training program, and they doubled their average ticket. And he wow. said, I can't believe this worked in a rural farm in Florida. I'm like, dude, I'm just teaching you the soft skills of how do we talk to other human beings. And he goes, yeah, but it's all different now. I go, what's different? He goes, instead of my customers coming in and like, getting it or my guys just shooting crap with them, they're actually coming in having discussions. They're looking forward to meeting them because they learned it's back and forth. They've learned how to talk mm. in a confident manner. So um, I think no matter where you are, and don't get me started on my railing on luxury brands because I, I buy things. I go into a lot of luxury stores and I walked into this one luxury store in Manhattan in, uh, in January and I walk in, it's freezing, right? It's a wind chill of like 10 degrees. I walk in and this woman says, can I get you a bottle of water? And I'm like, <laughs> that was the best. Like of all the things you could say in the world, my friend, I took them off the shelf. There's 3000. That's the one that's going to make the sale. And I was, I just looked at her like, uh, no. And then she went and she stood over and I mean, stalked over in the corner with her hands behind her back and fell in pose watching me. And I was like, and you think I'm going to buy a thousand dollar hoodie with that? And people don't realize that, yeah, in, if it was the middle of August, 
If it's in the middle of August, I was walking around Madison, it's 110. Like, that would have been amazing, right? Thoughtful, but, yeah. But the brain dead retail has got to end because it's just a big game. And if you understand, if I have fun, you're going to have fun, life gets easier. But I think, um, you know, you asked what's changed. Part of the thing that changed in retail is with employees masked up and suddenly having to be masked police, it was kind of like, stop. And so mm. what I've noticed, it seems like it's hardened a lot of retail uh, associates because they've gotten scared. You're going to punch them in the face or yell at them for a mask or whatever. And I just noticed, is it sure. Philadelphia today has reinstated a mask mandate? And I'm like, great. That's what everybody wants to hear. And wow. I get it. But that them and us has become really a big deal. And we're seeing it now uh, moving into the fight for unionization of Starbucks and Apple and some of these other things. It's like, it's them and us, and we're going to take it back. And I think there's an awful lot of people just don't realize what it was like to be an essential worker. But also, I think a lot of essential workers don't realize how it may have hardened their hearts and how they come off um, gruffer than they want to be. And because of that, I think they have disengaged from the process. So when we find our clients are doing great and they're telling me how it is, they say the difference is we don't hide behind the counter and we have to say, go wait on them. They understand that the party's in the aisles. And I think if you approach mm -hmm. all of it there, I can tell you stories about how that all works. But if you do that well, life is great. And I've, I've maintained that since, you know, I, I used to sell cowboy clothes back in the early days. And uh, this guy walked in, he's at the end of, about to open the door one day and he's got a goat skin jacket. I'm like, that's my window of contact. That's what I call it. So he, I, <laughs> he opened the door. I go, well, I turn on the lights, feel free to look around. I'll be right back. Come back out. And he's looking at a pair of hundred dollar cowboy boots. And I just said to him, that's a nice goat skin jacket you got. Did you buy that as a gift or was it for yourself? He goes, bought it for myself. I said, it's always nice to treat yourself. I just hit my store goal 10 years in a row. True story. Still had the jacket on. I just bought this yesterday. What are you celebrating? He said, well, the book that I wrote just got optioned for a movie. Have you ever heard of The Hunt for Red October? I'm Tom Clancy. You're like, holy crap. <laughs> and he paid cash. Do you think wow. I ever would have known I was waiting on that guy? Do you think we ever had that moment if I hadn't just taken that much of saying, I'm curious about that guy? And that's what's missing. Right. You know, people hate their job and they win. Great, you win. I hate my job. Yay, you. Why do that? Yeah. Do you think that's where the majority of retailers fail is in um, creating an environment where their employees care? Is that what's behind the, the majority of all of these things is that they fail to um, give that whatever motivation for the, for the employee or whatever it might be um, from the business owner? Do you think that's where they fail is to just make them care? Well, it's training is, is what I come back to. They don't know what success looks like. The owner doesn't know what success looks like. You can't enumerate it. Mm. You can't say it to me. Success looks like retail is a game of yes. So the more yeses we get, the better we'll make a sale. So let me show you how that all works. And that takes weeks and months. It's not a, it's sure. not a checklist, a post-it notes. Here's what you do. Okay, done, go. And yeah. you, know, you look at the great retailers, uh, the great retailers um, who have invested in training right now and they realize that the only way employees are going to care is if they know what success looks like you gave them the tools to do it and then they meet with success with it and they're like hey that was easier it's like i know <laughs> instead of can i help you find something no can i help you find something no do you have, uh, i'm looking yeah. for a couch do you have a budget uh i don't know under 300 bucks there's the tan one over there uh, it, 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 that's all we got and what it is is customers are, are uh, interruption or they're, you know, they're, it's them and us. And I think that's the key after the pandemic is understand, rightly so, that's, we understand how we got there, but, but bringing that curiosity back is not going to be uh, email or, you know, let's all do a cheer. You really have to make them comfortable with what does success look like. Hmm stalking you for the last several years, I've learned some things about the sales process that you teach that is different than what most retailers um, do. And um, one of those things is uh, just 
some of the smallest nuances um, that you try to break the cycle of habit of a lot of employees and um, such as uh, maybe not saying how's it going and saying good morning or good afternoon, things like that. Um, is there what is the sales process? Obviously, this is a can be a very detailed question, but what do you think the the failure is in the sales process that a lot of retailers might not even be thinking of? So some some little nuances to it similar to that. It's funny. I worked with one of the uh, biggest diamond uh, retailers in the world, and they wanted me to present six times. And I was like, oh, okay, well, what is it? Just on closing techniques. <laughs> I was like, really? Wow. Like, yeah, just on closing techniques. It's like, I'm not your guy. What do you mean? <laughs> I said, you lost the sale yeah. long before you get to closing techniques. No, yeah. I said, I grew up on that crap. The alternative choice. Which one would be better, this or this? Therefore, they've bought that. Oh, just throw me up. How much too much is that for you, Steve? Uh, $100. And how long do you think you'll have that? Uh, 10 years. $10 a year. That's less than, that's less than $3 a month. And, and isn't your happiness worth 3 Oh, just make me throw up. And, yeah. you know, that stuff is still being tra uh, trained out there. And I don't think it ever worked, but I went through it. You know, in the 80s, I, that's how I became me. I mean, I read How to Influence Friends and uh, uh, How to Influence Friends and, what is it? How to when, when, friends, when and friends and Influence People. people. Uh, Dale Carnegie yeah. and all of the Zig Ziglar books and Tom Hopkins and all of those guys, because they all had the right idea, which is you have to have a process if you're going to succeed. And so, mm -hmm. you know, where does it go wrong? 80%, I don't care what decade you look at, 80% of customers say the one thing that pisses them off the most when they go into a store is what? What do you think it is? I would say somebody not talking to there them. There it maybe? is. We all know it. We all know it. It's common knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's different in our store. We greet everybody. Really? Let me send a mystery <laughs> shopper in. Uh, yeah. Well, we don't hey, need to do that. You yeah, want to be disappointed, send some secret shoppers. Yeah, that'll disappoint you. You greet people. Yeah. You greet people you know. Yeah, you. Yep. Or you'll say, "Hey, how's it going?" And I'll say, uh, "Why didn't you say good morning?" Oh, I know him. Oh, great. What's his name? Well, I don't know him that well. Well, then you don't know him, <laughs> right? Because if you're gonna say it, then say good morning, Steve. That would be amazing. Good morning, Rich. Good morning, Jane. That'd be amazing. But if you have to wait for your iPad to read that, you know, it scanned my phone and this is a valued customer and he spent $3,000 last year and the kid's looking down like, good morning, Bob. How was that tractor you bought from us, that implement, <laughs> right? I mean, that's where we're going because sure. a lot of people are trying to say the answer will be technology. And I just say, this is a smarter generation. They're not a... Mm. They're, they're not something to pity. These are smart people, but we aren't training it. So to your point, it goes off the rails at, at good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't want to say that. Great. What do you say? Uh, how are you today? Don't say that. Well, I feel comfortable. Uh, well, let's role play that. Uh, how are you, ask me how I am today. This is my favorite. Thing. How are you today, Bob? <laughs> oh, you know, uh, I was walking down uh, Fifth Avenue the other day, and I got this blister in my Nikes, and it like started rubbing, and now it's bleeding into my foot. And as I got home, like I could hardly walk, and I was late to work. Do you care about any of that? You don't. You don't want to hear anything. You want to hear. I'm great, and how are you? Like we're Stepford Wives people, just robots. Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing is, this thing is going to cluck or cheap or grab their attention. So if I just mm. say, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, you'll usually say 90% of the time, thank you, or good morning, good afternoon, good evening to me. <laughs> Isn't that a better way to start? And then you yeah. got to build rapport. You have to get into building rapport, and then you move into discovery because a customer is coming in, uh, and they are going through, and they are trying to... Um, find something, you know, the big mistake I think so many retailers make, Steve, is, you know, if, if my computer printer needed a new cartridge today, and it's HP 64, well, I'd probably just order that online. I don't need to go to a store. But the mistake is I walk into an office uh, supply store looking for that, and you think that's all I want. And the reality yeah. is people go online to buy. We go into a store to shop. There's something else that we might take home uh, that we could use, might do some paper, some other things, 
but that's your job to have fun and to get everything in the sale they could use. Obviously, paper would be one, I would say, if you're going to get a new cartridge. But many miss it because we, again, have this idea that a store is a warehouse, and that's already being done by Amazon and all the online competitors. You have four walls which can romance somebody from being a price-driven shopper to a everything-I-need shopper. And you must know that yourself in your own business, man. Sure. What about what about you know when I when I first heard of you it was it was the sales process and training people and things like that and that's what I thought you did specifically but I I've seen just as much things um, whether it's articles or or whatever uh, on the importance of the layout of your um, store and your displays and things like that as well do you think that and I know the answer is both are important but do you think that one uh, let's say having good customer service can overcome the layout of the store or the layout of the store can overcome bad customer service. Do you think um, that one is more important than the other? If, if I had to, if I held a gun to your head, it always comes down to you, how your employees engage the stranger. The reason mm -hmm. you don't want to counter on uh, if you're in North America, the reason you want to counter on the right as I walk in the store is you have people who will be checking out crossing into people who are coming into a store. That's bad karma. It's bad energy. It's bad feng shui. It's just bad all the way around. You can see bad coffee mm -hmm. houses do this all the time. It's like, what are we supposed to do? Where they put the condiments right by? It's like, don't do that. So Traffic it's, flow. it's yeah. a frustration point, but it's not a, um, you know, people that don't understand your, your wants, your best, your brightest should be in the first third of your store as I walk in, because that's what's going to get me to walk the next third in. Most stores, if you're not thinking about it, we come in and we search, kind of like those little murkeets, you know, look around, like get the lay of the land, like, no, they don't have anything I want. And you might have 10,000 SKUs when the customer's like, nope, they don't have anything. You don't know what I've got. So what do we do then? Yeah. Oh, I'll put it all in the window. Oh, that's even a better idea. Just put a bunch of crap in the window and then make sure we cover the back of it with some kind of a background so we can't see in. The reason why that's so bad is people are attracted by more people. So you want people to see people actively shopping. And if you have a dead store, you just have your employees go from over here to the back, to the front, whatever, until somebody walks in and then they go back and, and it all worked. But it's, you know, I did business makeovers for the LA Times for a number of years. And so, yes, I speak about uh, store layout. And we did a huge one for an Agco dealer up here in uh, uh, the Catskill Mountains. And he went, I think, from 5 million to 9 million in a year. That's before wow. COVID. And wow. we elevate his store like you can't imagine. It was pretty much a shed. And then it became <laughs> a, a full-featured retail store. And what, when we got to the end of it, I asked him, so what did you think of the process? He goes, why the hell did I ever not do this before? And I go, because wow. nobody showed you. And that's the thing I would, your listeners too, right? It's, you can't be held responsible for stuff you don't know. But once you know it, sure. Once I tell you this is how it, it works and you buy like sales or X and you're going through the system and you don't do the mystery shops, well, then you really only did half of it because all you care about is how did I, how did I make somebody feel when they were in my store? For those five minutes, if it's a longer purchase, 20 minutes, people who feel they matter buy more and people that don't walk. And a lot of people give platitudes. Oh, we love our customers. Great. Let me see it. Let me see a mystery shop. Well, I, 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 it's like, you know, you live because here's the thing. I walk in the door and I see this. So I see it in this moment. I decide that these are cool. So I, I pick them up in that second. You know, those little champagne poppers you have at weddings and stuff. Those little things you pull and the little <laughs> confetti goes up. Yep. Just picture that that goes up. And I'm like, oh, I'm considering it. And my mind is like, I could use this. I could give it as a gift or whatever. And I put it down and nobody saw it. That was your moment. That's like watching your mm. two-year-old who first walks. I don't know when two-year-olds walk, but uh, the, that sure. moment, if yeah, you miss it, that's right. you missed it. So they go around, they look around, they might pick something else up. And, and, and you, don't, you aren't part of the conversation. The merch can't do the heavy lifting. And so when you mm. can, and I'm not saying I'm looking for bespoke, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, like we're selling a, a Maserati, but there's an element of being human in a less human world is where brick and mortar is moving. And if you can master that, 
then I think you're going to have a great time. And if not, you're going to be out of business because quite simply, you're not going to get employees to stay there. Your turnover is going to be too high. You're just going to be chasing your tail with price and with supply chains and all the other problems. Uh, it's just not going to be profitable. 